and happy Sabbath. Welcome to our service. I pray that we all will be blessed from today's program. Let's begin with Hope Sabbath School. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. This is an amazing series, Rest in Christ. We need that rest for our souls. And today, finding rest in our family relationships. What an important topic. I'm glad you joined us and welcome to the team. Well, we've got the team of five here in the studio, but we also have some joining us remotely. Shana, welcome. We're glad you're joining us remotely. Addison, Great to have you with us again. And Puya, great to have you with us on our study today. And I'm also excited because Stephanie's going to teach today. And we're always excited to see how the Holy Spirit blesses as we open the Word of God together. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, as we talk about finding rest in our family relationships, I'm praying the Holy Spirit would bless us in a powerful way. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we open. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your faithfulness to us, for showing us through your word the good and some of the challenging times in each person's experience. Lord, I pray that as we study this topic today, that our hearts would be energized to know that you are walking with us Amen. wherever we go. Teach us from your word and send your spirit to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So our topic today is on uh, finding rest in dysfunction, or should I say, finding rest despite dysfunctional uh, family relations. Mm. Yeah. When you think of a, a family or a dysfunctional family, what, how would you describe that? Can you tell me what that looks like? Mm. Jason. So a word that comes to mind for me is divorce. There's been a breakup in the marital relationship. Okay. Break up in a marital relationship. Anything else? Abuse. Sabina. I can think also of violence. Violence. Yes. Haiti. Abuse, I would say. Abuse. Uh, in, in many different forms, emotional, physical, sexual. Mm -hmm. So not just, um, not just a uh, verbal abuse, but also physical abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Daisy. I was thinking lack of love, because if there's mm. no love, nothing seems to hold together. Mm. All right. Mm. Lack of love. Billy. Um, instability. Instability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have Yeah, I was thinking that probably we all have some dysfunction mm -hmm. in our families. Mm -hmm. And I would say a dysfunctional family is something that falls short of God's ideal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is the immeasurable, unfailing love of God revealed yeah. in all of our relationships. Yeah. Absolutely. It takes many different forms, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. I, of course, you know that I would look this up, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, this is what I found. A dysfunctional family is one in which conflict, misbehavior, and often child neglect or abuse on the part of individual parents mm -hmm. occurs continuously mm -hmm. and regularly leading other members to accommodate such actions. Mm. Regardless of how we define it or how we describe it, we recognize that our study today is one of serious magnitude, right? Yes. Mm. Yes. This, is, this is something that impacts each one of us, mm -hmm. whether personally or beyond. Mm -hmm. We all have, we live in a world that is broken. That's mm -hmm. right. And we have brokenness and dysfunction all around mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to look at Joseph, the life of Joseph, all right? And as we consider Joseph and his life, mm. we'll be picking up his story in Genesis chapter 37. But if you can go back mm. to Abraham starting around chapter 16 <laughs> up through verse mm. uh, or chapter 36, what are some experiences or mm -hmm. examples in that uh, line, that family line, that family history that would give you the in idea mm -hmm. that there was some family dysfunction going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can anyone tell me? <laughs> All right, Haiti. There are so many. But, um, <laughs> polygamy is one 
mm -hmm. that cause a lot of issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jason? So Abraham tried to solve God's problem and he actually ended up uh, having his wife's servant be uh, another wife of his, sort of, and then having a kid. And so you had this dysfunction between uh, brothers who were from different mothers and competition for who would receive special treatment. Mm -hmm. All right, so there was special treatment. There was um, um, separation between the family members. Mm -hmm. And there was also some uh, lying that took place there with Abraham yeah. and Sarah. Yeah. Uh, Shana. I'm thinking of, well, you said from Abraham all the way to Joseph. I'm thinking of Jacob and his mom deceiving mm -hmm. Isaac mm -hmm. so that Jacob re could receive the, the blessing from mm -hmm. Isaac that was rightfully for his twin brother Esau. Mm -hmm. All right, so deception and uh, Puya. Yeah. And, and continue on, Jacob was deceived or tricked into marrying uh, mm -hmm. two sisters who did not get along very well. <laughs> All right, so we, we see, do you see that there's some generational trends Absolutely. that have taken yes. place? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's deception yeah. that gets mm -hmm. repeated. There's, uh, as a result of favoritism, mm -hmm. we would say that there was separation among um, the family members. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. go ahead. Jason. I also wanted to add, uh, it's not really happy, but there's even uh, sexual violence that uh, mm -hmm. occurs in the story leading up to uh, Joseph's life related to his brothers. And there's some, some pretty disgusting things that take place in there. Mm -hmm. So what can we learn from this, these generational trends that we see? What can we learn about dysfunctional families as a result? Uh, Sabina, Billy, and then mm -hmm. we'll go to Poya. Sabina? One thing that I can think of is that it generally takes, you know, um, impacts in the following generation. So it's not something that only happens to the immediate family, but to the ones that are coming after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Billy. That um, just because a family is, let's say, God ordained or blessed by God, that they're not immune f from the effects of mm. the environment, that yeah. you may be a Christian, but you still, your family can still be dysfunction. So. Um, it also makes it relatable because, you know, people can relate to you because they know that bec um, because your family is dysfunctional and my family is dysfunctional that we share something in common. Unfortunately, that's a bad thing, but it, it makes us more human in some cases. All right. Mm -hmm. So dysfunction is not limited to those who are non-believers, mm -hmm. nor is it limited to those who have been married and have had a divorce, but dysfunction impacts beyond that, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, Puya. Right. And I also want to add that none of us get to choose which family to be born into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to dysfunctional families, uh, nobody chose to be in that, you know, uh, dysfunctional relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. So yeah. this, is, this is not a choice of whose family we're going to be a part of. Right? Yeah. Now with all of this dysfunction that we see, if you go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to look at a few verses, uh, 17 through 22. And Shana, if you would be prepared to read that for us. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. This is, what do we know this chapter as? The faith chapter. The faith chapter. chapter. And this is the list of all of the great people, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. somehow Abraham, Isaac, and, um, you know, they're listed here in this chapter. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you go ahead and read that for us, Shana? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received in he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel 
and gave commandment concerning his bones. So my question for you then is, considering their messy uh, mm. family dysfunctional relationships and things that took mm. place, mm -hmm. how did they get in the lineup of those who are highly honored? Mm. Haiti. That's the best part that Puya alluded to. You don't have to be perfect to still be considered a child of God and to still have faith in Him. Mm -hmm. You could um, be a Christian and make mistakes sometimes, but you don't have to have, let sin have dominion over you, mm -hmm. like Paul says. Mm. Mm. Yes. yes. Billy. Yeah, and also it teaches us that we shouldn't define people by their mistakes. Mm -hmm. that people, everybody makes a mistake, but that is not their definition. We're thinking of, for instance, people who are, who are in prison, um, that they shouldn't be defined by that one single act. And the Bible encourages us to see people beyond the outer shell and uh, their potential instead, um, just to be like Jesus, basically seeing people like Jesus. So it's, it's a trend, it's the trend of life, but there's something that each one of those individuals had in common. Faith. Mm. It was faith. Mm -hmm. faith. And if, if this is your first series that you're watching, we had a series prior to this one. We talked about the faith um, of Abraham, and it is an exchange. It's not what we deserve, mm -hmm. but it's, it's this change, the mm -hmm. exchange of what Christ gave us that we deserve mm -hmm. for what he, um, he offers us. Mm -hmm. I did see Addison, you had a comment. Yeah, I heard what Billy was sharing. And we just look around us. I mean, whether in the community, uh, over here in Canada, or just all around the world, I mean, all we see is broken people. We are all broken people. We all are in need of a savior. Mm -hmm. And uh, this faith chapter is so encouraging because it's all the way through from Abraham <laughs> through Jacob. It's, you see dysfunction, but then again, you see a faith in Christ like you talked about Stephanie. Mm -hmm. that can trump all that. We can have a new beginning in Christ. We can find rest in Him when we put our trust and faith in Him every day. Mm -hmm. Amen. Darren, I think mm -hmm. it's really important. I know we've got to get into the story here, but these stories do not validate dysfunctional behavior. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is saying it's okay to do all of these terrible things that are described. It's, it is saying that those who are in Christ can be a new creation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we can be Amen. forgiven. Yeah. Yes. But terrible things we may have done, but it doesn't make them okay. That's right. Yeah. No. In, in fact, Jesus says to that woman, go and leave your life of dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Leave your life of sin. Mm -hmm. so, so I know you want to look at, at, at now the life of Joseph, but, but he was an example mm -hmm. coming from, as Jason said, a very dysfunctional family, especially in terms of sexual conduct. Mm -hmm. who's willing to go to prison rather than do something that many people do without thinking it's a problem at all. That's right. Mm -hmm. So God can raise up men and women mm -hmm. of integrity, mm -hmm. e e even yeah. out of dysfunctional families. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Praise God. And with that, Daisy, would you take us to Genesis chapter 37, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4. And I'd like you to think of how this history of Joseph has impacted him, Joseph. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. Mm. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because his father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. Mm. 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 So what do you see here? What do you mm -hmm. see taking place? So there's jealousy because jealousy. there's preferential treatment towards Joseph. Mm -hmm. Favoritism, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you think that Joseph had anything that he might have added to that mm -hmm. jealousy? Absolutely. Well, <laughs> I, I see yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, Shana, go ahead. 
I'd say Joseph was just being Joseph and they didn't like him for it. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe his father had a role in in contributing by playing favoritism Mm -hmm. between him and his other brothers, but. uh, All right, Addison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with Shana. Uh, It it probably didn't help that Joseph had this most beautiful robe, but I I wanna believe that Joseph uh, maintained his integrity and uh, they, were just, they were just upset and despised him because of what Jacob had said and how Jacob treated him. Hmm. Sabina? And I'm also looking at verse uh, number two, at the end of the verse when it says that Joseph brought a bad report of his brothers to the father. So I can think that this probably aggravated also the situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Joseph had more than just that kind of report. What did, mm-hmm. he, he dreamt dreams, right? Let's look at those dreams yes. in uh, verses 5 through 11. And I'm, Haiti, would you read that for us? Sure. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it says, Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Mm. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Hmm. So did the dreams bring them closer together. (laughs) It didn't. Okay, what do you see? Addison, I think I saw your hand just before. Yeah, so with it, it only enhanced their their anger and how much they despised him. Um, They did not take kindly to this notion that, oh, this is what God, uh, this is what you're seeing in your dreams that we have to bow down to you. Could we say they they were already starting to somewhat interpret that dream as it relating to them? They were already seeing a correlation. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I I thought to myself, why did he share that dream when he already knew there was some anger and hostility? Why do you think? Well, I I think Addison's right that he is a person of integrity, but he's somewhat naive here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It yeah. wasn't necessary. It wasn't like a mm. prophecy that, that God asked him to share with his family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he might have shared it discreetly with his father, mm-hmm. but knowing the hostility there, I, I think he'd been spoiled. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, he just wanted to say, I had this dream and you were all bearing down to me. Yeah. Um, so mm-hmm. is that a sin? I guess it becomes sin if you become pr- proud and arrogant. Otherwise, it's just a little lack of common sense, perhaps. Mm-hmm. But it definitely made them e- hate him even more. Mm-hmm. Mm. So much yeah. so that when his brothers went mm. and took the flocks, right, to feed them in Sheshem, mm. when his father, what happened? The next few verses, his father sent him to his brothers to see how they were doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and. A distance off, they saw him, and they started plotting. Let's mm-hmm. pick up that story in verse 18. Mm-hmm. And same chapter, Genesis 37, verses 18 through 28. And Jason, would you read that for us? Let's see what they do when they see him coming. Have the New King James Version here. Genesis chapter 37, verses 18 to 28. Now when they saw him afar off, Even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, 
Some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Mm -hmm. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Mm. Mm. All right, so some serious mm -hmm. results mm. Of, mm. of anger, frustration, and this uh, separation between the brothers. Mm -hmm. It doesn't end there, right? It's usually, dysfunction mm. usually doesn't just impact a small number, mm -hmm. but it impacts greater. Let's take a look at the impact it had on his father, Jacob. Let's look at verses 31 through 35. Mm. Um, and Billy, would you read that for us? Genesis 37, verses 31 to 35. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this, examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Mm. Then Joseph tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. As his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to, com to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Mm. What lesson can we learn from the brother's deception of their father? Mm. Any lessons? Addison? I see here that it, it added to Jacob's suffering, the dishonesty, the, the dysfunctionality, um, the strife, the, the um, aggravation towards Joseph that was going on in their hearts. It just added to his suffering, and so nothing good came out of it. Mm. Do you think their lives were better or worse after they did that act? Worse. Worse, worse, but they thought it was going to be better, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it didn't prove to be, to make it any better no. for him, yeah. for them. Yeah. Now, Joseph is sold into Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at that point, after going through a dysfunction, right, he has options. Mm -hmm. And quite mm -hmm. frankly, I think there's only two options that he could have chosen. Mm -hmm. What were those options? Daisy. I think him knowing God, he could have said, God, why would you let this happen to me? Mm. Um, the two options would be continue trusting God to be there for him or just say, God, I give up. Like, you're not, you're, mm. not, you're not a God I thought you were because why would you let bad things happen to me if I'm mm. serving you? Mm -hmm. mm. So those were the two options I think he could have taken, either to continue serving God or just turn his back on God. Mm. He could have mm. either fully run to God and fully put his trust in him, which we know that he did. And we'll look at some of those verses, mm -hmm. so um, be ready for that one. But he could have walked away mm -hmm. and said, mm -hmm. as you were saying, why didn't you care for me? Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. trust you. Yeah. Yeah. Haiti. Oh, well, I, I just wanted to comment on the fact that they um, concealed that lie for that long. Like sometimes we think when we've done something wrong that we're better off, you know, hiding it. 
but we see here, like you were saying, that it just made it so much worse. And it actually would have been better if they just would have come forward and said, I did this wrong thing. Um, there may have been hope for the father to have gone and you know, sought after his son, brought him back, um, maybe addressed some of the dysfunctional issues there that led to that. Um, and I, I don't know, I just think that that's, there's something really important and really powerful there um, for our lives today that we shouldn't think that we should hide things you know, when we make a mistake, it's actually just better to address the mistake than to continue to, you know, to try to hide it because we're afraid of the consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Billy. Yeah, I just want to point out that this is in the backdrop of these are God's children mm -hmm. and they are committing these heinous acts. And um, as I said before, like we're not immune to these acts if we don't check them, that they've been cultivating those jealousies and Joseph obviously and his father didn't help it. But when we go for such a long period and not examine ourselves mm -hmm. and we can we have the potential to do evil and your own brother that you know you can kill that's that's a potential when you don't check yourself and uh, surrender yourself to, to God and just because somebody let's say is a believer doesn't mean that they're immune mm -hmm. to these consequences or reaching these conclusions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thankfully we know that that Joseph instead of running away yeah. he ran he he clung to Jesus to God. Yeah. And I like us to look at those verses in verse uh, chapter 39. We'll look at verses one through three. Mm -hmm. And Addison, if you would read that for us, we're looking at Genesis 39, one through three to take, uh, see that evidence where Joseph was fully trusting in his Lord. And I'm reading from the King James Version. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. yeah. That the Lord was with him, mm -hmm. right? He, he went with him to Egypt and it was very clear. Mm -hmm. There's something about him mm. that the Lord blesses everything he does. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you think about dysfunction and the options that you have, either turning away from God mm -hmm. or turning towards him for help, I mean, why is it so crucial to fully trust the Lord when you're trying to move on from a dysfunctional uh, situation. Mm. Jason. Well, I think if you look at uh, Joseph's story, he could easily say, look, I come from a dysfunctional family. Uh, my family fights for who can be the best and now they've sold me as a slave. So I need to look out for myself. I need to think how I can take care of myself. And mm. Joseph very much probably was tempted with that opportunity. And a lot of people look at life and say, well, if I want to succeed in life, mm -hmm. especially if I'm a slave, I've got to do whatever I can. If mm -hmm. I have to lie, cheat, deceive, mm -hmm. anything I can, I'm at the bottom. So whatever I can do to work myself up to the top or at least out of the bottom, mm -hmm. you know, who cares about God? I'm going to do things my way. Mm -hmm. And that's a big temptation. Uh, and a lot of people would say, well, Joseph wouldn't be unjustified if he had thought that way, but yeah. he went a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Daisy yeah. and then Derek. I wanted to throw in the fact that it started with one sin back in the Garden of Eden and mm -hmm. everything, it led to multiple sins that has compounded over the years up till now. So mm -hmm. sin started dysfunction. Um, when we allow sin to rule our lives, there's no telling where we're gonna end up. Mm -hmm. We have a choice to make whether we wanna trust God to help us out of the sinful nature that we're in to be able to make right choices. Otherwise, if we allow sin to rule our lives, we keep making bad choices all the way through. But Joseph allowing God to lead his life, he knew we're, we're sinful beings. Mm -hmm. So the tendency for sinful things to happen is there. But knowing that there is a God who wants to save, despite the sinful nature that we're in, he's depending on God to see him through the mess that he was already in, so. Mm. Was it possible that he looked back and he saw that dysfunction and he said, someone has to stop this. Right. 
Mm. It's going to stop here with me, mm. uh -huh. Derek. Mm. Yeah, that um, just that sentence touched my heart because praise God, we can make that decision. Amen. Mm. Yes. Yes. Now, I don't think we can break the dysfunctional cycle. Right. We can yeah. cry out to God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Say, God, I could be acting like my ancestors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. But I cry out to you to break that dysfunctional cycle in yes. my life. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. look at what God does. It's beautiful, beautiful testimony. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I did see Addison's hand. And I'll go ahead and make your comment, and then we'll continue. Mm. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I just with my own experience just growing up and I, I can to some degree I, I can sort of relate to, to Joseph and, and possibly how what he was going through but uh, it's just so remarkable that here he did not make his family the dysfunctionality an excuse nobody said no I'm gonna learn I'm gonna look at that history I'm gonna learn from those mistakes before without having to make those mistakes mm -hmm. and say Lord I'm gonna glorify you Mm. in everything I do. Amen. 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 And he, there's a very clear example of him doing that. And that mm. is in mm. Genesis 39. Mm. And we'll look at verse, verses 6 through 8 and 10. And Poya, would you read that for us? Genesis 39, 6 through 8, and then verse 10. Sure. And I'll be reading from uh, the New King James Version. Genesis 39, 6 through 8 and 10. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in this house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. And verse 10, So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Mm. Mm. All right, so what was the temptation that Joseph faced? What was the temptation? Shana? to commit adultery with his master's wife. Okay, so that was just a one-time event or one-time multiple? No, it says she was there repeatedly ad admonishing him to lay with me. Mm -hmm. Day after day, what, what was it that caused him to choose not to? Mm -hmm. Derek? Stephanie, I think it was bigger than just the sexual temptation. It was a temptation to survive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because yeah. she held his life mm -hmm. in her hands. Mm -hmm. In fact, we see she lies about him later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think, I think it's like you have to do this mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think he, mm -hmm. and it, it, the fantastic choi choice he makes is not only to honor God in terms of mm -hmm. his sexual conduct, mm -hmm. but to be willing, if necessary, to die mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than to dis dishonor God. Mm -hmm. So, Derek, are you saying that he could have reasoned why he could do this in order to save his life so he could be a, a better witness, maybe? I can just imagine the enemy whispering mm -hmm. that in his ear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jason. And back to his history of family dysfunction, this is one of the things that happened a lot in his family. This is one of their almost like generational curses or sins, mm -hmm. if you will. And he's mm -hmm. being tempted with this very thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Daisy. I wanted to add, I agree with what uh, Pastor Derek was saying. He made a statement in verse 9 that says, how could I do this great sin against God? So mm -hmm. he was looking at the bigger picture. He's not looking at his situation in Potiphar's house because Potiphar had entrusted him with everything. The only thing he didn't give him was his wife or whatever he ate. Mm -hmm. But his finances and everything was in Joseph's hand. So it's like a betrayal to sleep with your master's um, wife, if you would do that. But he wasn't saying because of what Potiphar did. He says, mm -hmm. how can I do this sin against God? Mm -hmm. So what held him back yes. was the foundation of his relationship with his, God. his Heavenly Father, yes. right? Mm -hmm. That's what held him back. Yeah. Um, how did Potiphar's wife respond? Can someone summarize to me what 
What took place there? Haiti. Well, she is so upset and offended, I guess, maybe by the fact that he rejects her even to that point of leaving his, you know, his robe and running from her, um, that she makes up this terrible lie that he tried to assault her and mm -hmm. she screamed and that's what made him stop. Mm -hmm. So she reverses her own sinful behavior onto him. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. as a result of that, Potiphar throws him in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at, go ahead, Derek. You I just to have to say, that it's very clear from the story that Potiphar didn't believe his wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If he had believed his wife, Joseph would, would have been dead. Yes. It's tragic that Joseph ends up in prison, but he ends up in the king's prison. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost even in that testimony, mm -hmm. there's this mm -hmm. powerful witness to Potiphar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that this young man is a man of integrity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, even in what seems like a very unfair outcome, yeah. there's a powerful witness to that, uh, to that leader, to Potiphar. Yes, mm. Daisy. I wanna throw this in here as well. You know, when we are in a sinful community, but when one person stands out to look better than everybody else, you see that the rest of the people who are starting to look bad want to punish that person that is standing mm -hmm. out as good. You can see this happen with the brothers because Joseph was reporting on them and saying that they were doing bad things and they didn't like it. They were starting to look bad. And so they wanted to silence Joseph, but he ended up in Potiphar's house. Same here, Potiphar's wife is trying to get Joseph to sin. But then she realizes Joseph is not like her, like not sinful, he has integrity. And so mm -hmm. she gets mad and is trying to punish him again. So this mm -hmm. is something that happens a lot Mm. On, um, mm. with us in nature when mm. one person wants to live a righteous life the rest of the others who's, who don't make that choice want to silence that person or destroy that person mm. 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 it's true any other thoughts on that mm. before we move on <laughs> all right i i just have to ask the question because there are people that have asked this question of me if you had a friend who heard this story and they said, where was God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. Someone's watching and they have been damaged, mm. permanently damaged mm. by dysfunction in their home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And their question to you is, where was God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he help? Mm -hmm. What did we say, Sabina? Mm. Stephanie, the first thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, we have various events in the Bible that show to us that unfortunately, because of sin, God not always get what he wants. And that's really sad to hear because he has a remedy for that. We know that ultimately uh, he's pointing us to the sanctuary, to uh, the day of the final judgment. But there are many events in, in which even Jesus cried upon, you know, and so, was sorrowful for the decisions that his people have made uh, that were contrary to his will. So I think I would start first trying to display in actions my love towards this friend of mine or whoever was asking me these questions. But eventually in getting the questions that were more theological or like in where was God, I would try to teach them, showing the Bible what are the effects of sin and how is it that God can play a part in restoring and redeeming us from places where sin have abundant, you know? So acknowledge mm -hmm. that what took place was not God's will. Exactly. Was not God's mm -hmm. will. Daisy. It's unfortunate when things like that happen, but I also want to assure people listening that there's always a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. There's a bigger picture to the story that we don't see. If we look at what happened, everything that happened was bad for Joseph, but it was God's providence that led to something better that ends, we'll eventually find out as we read the story. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it takes unfortunate circumstances to lead us to beautiful things. Um, I've learned through some things, somewhere I read, I can't remember exactly where, mm -hmm. but it says that there's always something positive to find if you take your time in any negative situation that happens to you. No matter how terrible the situation is, it can, there's something positive you can get out of it. And in this case, we'll learn that Joseph's ended up in Egypt became a blessing to many. 
Mm. I don't want to jump ahead of us, but <laughs> I just want to say that there is a bigger picture and sometimes it takes painful situations to actually get to a beautiful end. Mm. Addison and then Puya, the question is, what do you say to someone who says, where was God in this situation? Mm. Mm. You know, there's a beautiful illustration of two sets of footprints along the shore of a beach, in the sandy beach. But there's at one point where there's only one set of footprints, and that may be ours. And we might be asking, where is God through all that? And then that's when he'll come to us and say, no, that's, there's only one set of footprints, because those are the moments in your life when I'm carrying you. Mm. And so I would share that with someone who needed that encouragement. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah. mm. I, I would also add to that, um, picking up on what Daisy pointed out, uh, to encourage whoever is going through a situation where they're asking the question, where is God? Why didn't God do that? Uh, that sometimes we don't understand the bigger picture. Um, there are a lot of questions that will never be answered in this world. But we, the, the, the more important question is, can we trust that God loves us? If our answer to that question is yes, in light of the cross where we see God giving us his son, the rest of the question can be answered later as long as we can trust that he has the best intention for us. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. We are... Sabina. I'm thinking also at the verse that says that in all things God's, God works together for our good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's another verse I would bring to them and just would like to share if someone is watching us. Yes, all things work together for good. It doesn't mean that those things are good. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. uh -huh. It's not justifying what mm -hmm. took yeah. place. Yes. In fact, if you're in the middle of a dysfunctional, mm -hmm. abusive situation, that's not yeah. good seek help yes, because yes. God doesn't desire you to be in that. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that at the end of the day, mm -hmm. that God is going to make all things new. You know. And there was something that we know, there's hope in, in every story. And Joseph, there was hope in that story. Mm -hmm. If you turn to Genesis 39, verse 29 or 21, there are words that are recorded there that are encouraging. Mm -hmm. And I'd like us to read that. Uh, right now. Daisy, do you have that? Could you read that for us? Sure. The New Living Translation says, But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful Amen. love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Mm -hmm. We see again, the Lord was with him where? In, in the prison. prison. Right? Yeah. The Lord walked with him. Yeah. And we, mm -hmm. in our previous study, we talked about having this relationship with God mm -hmm. so that when we're holding his hand, he's walking with us. Wherever mm -hmm. we go, he's with us mm -hmm. when he's been leading us. Billy. Yeah, I was going to say it's better to have God with you mm -hmm. in prison than to have, don't have God with you, yes. but then you're out of prison. Mm -hmm. So yes. the best place to be is where God is with you, maybe mm -hmm. in the prison mm -hmm. or in the palace. Yeah. Yeah. And John right. the Baptist was in prison mm -hmm. and remained faithful, and Jesus has no greater prophet ever. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the amazing thing in this story is that by the grace of God, we're talking about overcoming these family dysfunctions, yes. mm -hmm. that, that God can be honored. Yes. Mm -hmm. God does not like all of this no. damage of sin. That's why the mm -hmm. Savior came. Mm -hmm. But God can be honored in the life of a woman or man who says, I'm going to surrender all my life to the will of God and God mm -hmm. you be honored however mm -hmm. you choose to in this. Yes. And I will trust my Savior Amen. versus my Amen. circumstances. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right? Mm -hmm. Verse 22 and 23, if we could have Addison continue in Genesis chapter 39. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in that prison. Mm -hmm. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Mm -hmm. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, and the Lord <laughs> made it to prosper. Amen. So have we mm -hmm. heard this before? Yep. <laughs> have we seen this yep. before? Mm -hmm. He yep. went into Potiphar's house, and Potiphar finally said, everything I have, just, you know, all I'll know is 
the bread that's on my table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Now he's in prison, no. same response. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. There's something different about Joseph. Mm -hmm. Joseph has made a choice Amen. Mm -hmm. to fully trust mm -hmm. his Lord. Mm -hmm. yes. All right? Yeah. <laughs> what happens while he's in prison? Just summarize for me, there, there's, a, there's a baker and there is a Cup bear. Cup bear. Okay. What what takes place while he's in prison with them? Daisy? They both have dreams and don't understand what it is. And then Joseph interprets the dream for them. And then what he said would happen was pretty much a prediction of what was going to happen to them in the future. And it happened exactly. The baker, um, which one got, someone got beheaded. <laughs> I remember exactly. Right, the baker. Yeah. And then one of them got promoted to be the king's cup bear. Mm -hmm. So the, the butler was promoted and Joseph knew he was going to be. And so Joseph said, remember me mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I shouldn't even be here. Yeah. 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 So did, he, did the butler remember him? He didn't. The Bible says that for, it was two years yeah. until what happened? Until the king. Someone else has a dream. Yes. Yes. Pharaoh, has a, Pharaoh dream. has a dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that dream, it comes back to the butler. Oh, mm. Joseph helped me. Yeah. Mm. And then he remembers Joseph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you think about that, there's, there's so much more that we could talk about in those verses, but I want us to end on the promises mm. of someone. If you can think of a promise, share a promise uh, for someone who has been in a challenging situation, a family, a dysfunctional family situation. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead. If you already have it, um, you've memorized it, just give us a brief summary of it. I see Poya. I'm reminded of Jeremiah 29, 11, where we're told by God that where he said, for I know the plans that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Mm -hmm. I believe this is one of the most beautiful promises in the Bible. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Haiti. Mm -hmm. I think of John 16, 33, where it says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In mm -hmm. the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Daisy. I have one in uh, Psalm 37, verse 23 and 24. It says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Mm -hmm. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for Amen. the Lord holds them by his hand. Amen. Addison. <laughs> I think of the words of Joshua 1, 9, where it says, Be strong and courageous. Mm -hmm. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God, he will be with you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. God has great plans. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. I'm not saying it doesn't matter because it matters to God. It does. But he's walking with you. He will be with you wherever you go. Amen. And we can fully trust him. Mm -hmm. Praise God Amen. that we can see dysfunction and recognize that God will work mm -hmm. his plan even yes. through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Powerful story. What Amen. Joseph. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite text coming to mind was Hebrews chapter 13, where the Lord says, I will never leave you mm -hmm. or forsake you. Amen. We see it in Joseph's life. Mm -hmm. You can see it in your life. Just choose to hold on to his hand mm -hmm. even through those challenging times. Mm -hmm. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this was a challenging journey not only for Joseph but also for us as we think about our own lives. But thank you that as you were with Joseph and blessed him that you will never leave us or forsake us. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Eighty-eight countries is a lot, right? Tokyo alone is so large that there are 88 countries whose total population combined would still be smaller than the Tokyo metro area. Over time, the city has grown, spread, and merged with smaller surrounding cities, resulting in a massive urban area called an agglomeration. While Tokyo has grown to such an amazing size, the number of Christian believers in the city has remained small. 
only around 1% of the people in Japan are Christians. While Tokyo is the world's largest city, it's still just one of many very large cities. Out of the hundreds of agglomerations worldwide, 37 of them have more than 10 million residents. Over 100 years ago, Ellen White was urging the Seventh-day Adventist Church to reach the large cities of the world. Oh, that we might see the needs of these cities as God sees them, she wrote, adding that the work in the cities is the essential work for this time. She prompted, work the cities without delay, for time is short. But in 1900, around that very time, there were only 15 cities on earth that had more than 1 million residents. Today, that number has increased to almost 600. Many of these cities only have one or two Adventist churches, and some still have no Adventist presence at all. How can we make a difference? Through the mission offerings, Adventists around the world contribute to critical outreach in the cities. Perhaps at some point in your life you dreamed of becoming a missionary, but somehow it never quite worked out. If that's you, or if you have a heart for those who don't know Jesus, consider how faithful daily prayers for unreached cities could be a very real mission that could open doors and hearts even half a world away. Sharon has answered this call to prayer wholeheartedly. The Mission to the Cities prayer map arranges these cities on lines to look like a subway map. And Sharon uses it as a guide to pray for one city each day. She's been praying for more than a year, and she has already checkmarked more than 200 of these 580 large cities. She prays for the residents of the cities, for their health, their marriages, their leaders, and their faith. God hears her daily prayers, and Sharon believes that he is answering in quiet but amazing ways. She looks forward to hearing the stories one day in heaven. Adventist schools are also praying for the cities. At Hillside Christian School, a one-room school in Wisconsin, the students began by praying for the large cities in North America. Each day, they prayed for a different city. One student would pray for the homeless in the city. Another prayed for families. As a team, they took the needs of these cities to God in prayer and then checkmarked each city on the map. Churches and schools, adults, children, and academy students are praying for the cities. We believe that as we gather in spirit, praying in unity for the cities, God will be with us and hear our prayers. As you pray for each city, please ask God to bless the work of missionaries and global mission pioneers there. Prayer maps are available for download on the Mission to the Cities website. You can print them for yourself, your school, your prayer group, or your church. Please join other prayer missionaries and pray your way around the world. Good morning and welcome back. As we move into our family service, let's begin with our songs of praise.
This is the part of our service where we'd like to show you how you can give to your local conference or mission through your tithes, offerings or donations. Hi boys and girls, I have with me here a bowl of water. I wonder if this was my only bowl of water, how long do you think that I could make it last for or how long do you think it would last, keep me for? Maybe uh, a few days, a few weeks, maybe months, years. Mm, I, I don't think so, that this water could last for very long. Now, some of you may know what a drought is. For those of you who does not know what a drought is, it is when there is little or no rain for a long time. It could be months, it could be years. In Israel, during the summer months, it is usually very hot and dry. The people rely on the rains from this winter and the springtime so that they can get through the very hot summer months that they have. If it did not rain for even one year, the people would not be able to grow any crops. Not even grass will grow on the open fields for the cattle to eat. The rivers will all dry, dry up, look like dry earth and crack. People, crops, cattle, they will die from lack of food and water. Today, our story will take us to a time in Israel when God had to use a drought to teach a lesson. We will learn that God will supply all that we need. There was a prophet of God named Elijah. And at the time of our story, Ahab was king of Israel. He was a mean king and he worshiped false God. He would pray and worship the God Baal and ask him to bring rain. But the one true God sent Elisha to warn him about worshiping false God. Elijah went and Elijah told him, I am representing the Lord God. And he said that there shall be no rain nor no rain nor dew these years except at my words. Now, because of what Elisha told Ahab, Ahab hated him and he wanted to hurt him. But God wanted to keep Elisha safe. And he said to him, Go and hide by Kerit's brook. There you'll have plenty to drink and you'll eat what the ravens bring to you. Now boys and girls, for those who don't know, a raven is a type of bird. And the bird, how amazing is it to be fed by birds? You see, 
God wanted to teach Ahab and all those who were following him, following him a lesson. So it did not rain the next day or the next or the next. It did not rain for three and a half years. Boys and girls, three and a half years with no rain is very bad. Remember, no rain nor dew meant that there will be no crops or food. Elisha listened to what God had told him and he went to camp by the brook. And every day, morning and evening, the birds would bring meat and bread for him to eat. And he had plenty to drink, just as God had promised. God will supply all that we need. Just as oh, God took care of Elisha in that time by allowing the birds to bring food to him twice, each day we can rest assured knowing that god will do the same for us no matter what it no nothing could have stopped god from taking care of him and he found any uh, any means he would find any means to give us what we want boys and girls as the drought continued because remember this was going on for a long time you know so then the brook by which Elisha was staying, that began to get dry. And eventually it dwindled down to nothing. There was no more water. All the water went out. But that was not a surprise for God. That was part of the plan. He then told Elisha the next step that he should take. God will supply all that we need. He sent Elisha to the home of a poor widow. Now God had selected this widow specially to help Elisha. And even though the widow and her son was also affected by the drought, and even though they only had a little bit of flour and oil just to make the last bread, that was not a problem. God still used her to supply Elisha's needs. And miraculously, boys and girls, guess what? For the time that Elisha stayed with the widow, all that time, she never ran out of flour and oil to make the bread for them to have. Boys and girls, we remember, just as our God cared for Elisha, he will do the same for us today. God gave Elisha what he needed. He will give us what we need to. Thank you for listening to our sto my story. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? The child that you to a blind man did you know your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod and when you kissed your little baby you kissed the face of The blind will see, the deaf will hear, 
and the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the That your baby boy is Lord of all creation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would someday rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? The sleeping child you hold. like you to join me in prayer. Let us bow our heads. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord of lords and King of kings, we bow before you in worship and praise, thanking you for your creatorship, this marvelous world that you've given to us to steward and to care for. We thank you as well for sending Jesus, your son, to show us what you are like in all the beauty of character that you have. And when we see you in all your marvelous grace and mercy, we recognize our unmercifulness, our ungraciousness, our selfishness and our pride. And we confess before you, Lord, our sinfulness and our sins and ask that you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for the great promises of your word that we can claim today and to know that as we come before your presence, that rather than casting us out, you welcome us. You reach out to us with open arms and we are now in your presence, forgiven, redeemed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this incredible relationship that you have given us with you. And may we do everything to foster that and to grow deeper into it. Make clear to us through your spirit, Lord, anything that you want to change in our lives and in our relationships with other people. And help us to be obedient to your will. We ask, Father, not just for ourselves and our relationship with you, but for the church at wide. We thank you for its ministry for its care, for its many imperfect members and leaders. But we thank you that you are the one that we are serving and we love you. And we ask today for those leaders and for those members, let us hold them up for a few moments before you as we individually think of our own pastors, of the speaker this morning who is going to present your word as we think of the leaders of our church that are facing very difficult situations, of our members who are in conflicts, Lord, be with them all and guide them. We ask for those who are ill. There are plenty who have suffered with COVID. There are plenty who are suffering many other illnesses. We hold those that we are thinking about in our families and in our churches and in our nation and around the world before you now. We thank you, Lord, that you not only ask us to pray for our own situations, but you ask us to pray for our government. Sometimes we find that difficult to do, but we ask that through the ups and downs of the political turmoil that we're in, 
We pray that you would let peace, your peace, pervade what is taking place. And that indeed there will be space and time for your church to rise up and proclaim the message of your grace and goodness in this world, at this special end time that you've called us to. And so today, Father, as we continue with this service, we ask for your presence to fill our hearts and minds, and that you would challenge us not only to hear, but to be doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. ready good it is a pleasure to share with you today the word of God and I hope we'll be blessed as we look at the topic Jehovah Jireh based on Genesis chapter 22 Jesus declared my sheep hear my voice and they follow me the text illustrates the situation where at the end of a day's shepherding the shepherd would take his sheep to a communal sheep pen where several farmers would put their sheep for protection overnight. Now, to the average non-shepherd, you'd wonder, how will they separate their sheep in the morning? How will they know which sheep is which? Well, Jesus said, my sheep hears my voice and they follow me. In the morning, the shepherd would go to the pen and call out his main sheep, the leader of the pack. And that sheep would come to him, and all the other sheep belonging to that fold would follow that sheep. They know the voice of the shepherd. God's divine purpose has always been for the salvation of man. And sacred history describes from the beginning God's purpose to save human beings. God's grace describes his love, his mercy towards human beings. In the fall of man, we see grace at work. The divine pronouncement was that in the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. In the choice of Abraham as father of his chosen people, we see God's gracious act in seeking to resolve the problem of sin. God called Abraham. God said, get thee out from your kindred, from your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. As Abraham packed his stuff and began to go out, imagine one of his neighbors saying, Abe, where are you going? What would have been his answer? Abraham would say, I do not know. But God said, when I get there, I will tell you. That is crazy. But Abraham obeyed God. Abraham knew the voice of God, and Abraham followed where he led. After settling in Haran and living there until the death of Terah, God again spoke to Abraham, saying, move on. You have not yet arrived at the place I have set up for you. And so Abraham traveled further west until he came to the land of Canaan, where God said to him, walk up and down in this land and everywhere where your feet shall step will belong to you and to your descendants forever. And Abraham believed God. How much of the land did Abraham own in his lifetime? None, but for a little burial plot that he bought. He lived in the land of Canaan as a stranger, as a pilgrim. One day, God later said to Abraham, look at the stars. Can you count them? Your descendants, your offspring will be as numerous as the stars and as the sand on the seashore. 
How many children did Abraham have at that time when God spoke to him? None. When Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him and Sarah and said, Next year, this time, you shall have a son. And Sarah, listening behind the curtain of the tent, laughed. Because it was a ridiculous thing for God to say. Sarah was 89 years old, well past the period of childbearing. And was she going to conceive and become a mother? For 25 years, Abraham had believed God's promises and waited, hoping against hope for the birth of his son. And we see Abraham and Sarah helping God out, as it were. And the issues arose about the conception and birth of Ishmael. And so we come to the incident recorded in our text today. In Genesis 22, it says, God tested Abraham, not tempted, as the King James said. That is not the best translation, as the Bible says, God doesn't tempt anyone. God tested Abraham. Now, let us establish one crucial point. Does God know everything? Of course he does. Then why test Abraham if God knew what Abraham would do? Well, does Abraham know his own heart? No, neither do we. This test then was to reveal to Abraham the depths of his own love for God and also was aimed to be an object lesson to you and to me and, our, and all generations in all ages of the kind of commitment that God wishes for his true sons and daughters. As the Bible says, these things are recorded for our examples and for our learning upon whom the end of the ages have come. So let us remind ourselves of the text. Genesis 22 verse 1 says, And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled the donkey, his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. We learn from this passage that the true believer's duty is to offer radical obedience to God, not just when it is natural and easy, but to obey God even when it seemingly tears your heart apart. Child sacrifice was part of the Canaanite religious cult and form of worship. So Abraham would have been familiar with it. In their thinking, in the thinking of the pagans who offered their children, it was the, felt to that it was a duty of the believer to give his best to God. And what greater gift could he give to God than his firstborn son? What greater way to show his love and devotion to God than to sacrifice his nearest and dearest. At such a prospect, thinking of offering my own son, my, my whole heart twinges. But in this act of pagan worship, we see the demonic perversion of love and obedience, making a type of supreme sacrifice, offering to God a type of sacrifice that he does not require. But why test Abraham with a command that is ultimately against the will of God? Two possible answers come to mind. In the sacrifice of Isaac on Mount Moriah, God sought to establish once and for all that human sacrifice, no matter how apparently noble, was not a requirement from him. 
but that the only sacrifice suitable was the one that God himself would provide. God shall provide for himself a lamb. Secondly, Abraham had waited for 25 years for the fulfillment of God's ultimate promise of a son. And now the son has, had arrived. Would Isaac become an idol to Abraham? Would his love for his son exceed his love and devotion to his God? In this act, God wanted to reveal to Abraham his true love, his true heart. Did he truly love God enough to really offer to him, to God, that which he had waited and longed for all his life, his precious son? In the test, we also see foreshadowed a greater test, a greater gift, a greater love, the incidents that would transpire in Gethsemane and on Golgotha where Jesus Christ would offer himself as a true lamb of God. Some biblical commentators also think that the perverted act of child sacrifice was a demonic ploy uh, based on Genesis 3 verse 15, where God promises that the seed of the woman would come and would destroy Satan. And Satan, in an attempt to frustrate God's will, had men offer their firstborn son as an offering to God, hopefully thereby to kill this promised seed. This test of radical obedience would later be reflected in the command of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 and 38, where Jesus said, whoever loves, whoever would come after him, must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. If you love your father more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you love son or daughter or husband and wife more than me, you are not worthy of me. Love for God was supreme. Now, for a moment, put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Isaac is a child of promise. In him is wrapped up the, all the blessings that God had offered to Abraham. This is not just a test of offering up one's only son, but questioning of every component of his faith. If I obey and offer my son, how will God promise concerning Isaac be fulfilled? It was natural for Abraham to reason God really doesn't mean what he says. But how could Abraham be sure that this was the voice of God and not the voice of a demon? In the previous experiences of Abraham's life, we see him obeying the commands of God. The voice came and said, get out of your country and go. And Abraham recognized God's voice and obeyed. Later, the voice said, you will have a son. Abraham recognized God's voice and he believed and obeyed. He said, circumcise all the males. Abraham heard the voice of God. Abraham obeyed. Abraham had built a lifelong relationship with God and had come to know his voice in the small things. So when the big test came, he still knew that still small voice. We develop the habit of knowing the voice of God by spending time in meditation and prayer and by reading the words of Scripture. Do you know the voice of God? Have you developed a relationship of intimacy with God so that when He speaks to you in easy or difficult moments, you can know him and safely follow him. In James 1, 3 and 4, we are told, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect 
and complete, lacking nothing. If I received, my youngest son was 18 two days ago. Now, if I received a vision from God saying I should offer Reese as a burnt offering to God, then I know that that is not the voice of God. But Abraham was not in my situation. Tests that come from God can often be more grievous than the ones that come from the devil, said Martin Luther. Many believers wrestle with God and even lose their faith as a result of the tests and trials that they undergo. Many Jews ask, where was God during the Holocaust? Some parents, where was God when my baby died? Many people struggle with, where was God when I was being abused? Where was God when I suffered from cancer and I fasted and prayed, asking for deliverance? Abraham's test was unique. But tests and trials are common to all believers. Such grievous tests like Abraham come only to the chief of saints. Such come only upon special people like Abraham and Job. Now, Abraham's journey from up to Mount Moriah leads to a God-forsakenness that was fully borne by Christ the night in which he was betrayed. All true believers must be assured that should they find themselves where the face of God seems hidden and heaven seems deaf to their cries, that in such a severe trial, though hidden, God is still there by their side, testing their faith. James 1.12, blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. I cannot imagine Abraham's journey to Moriah. Abraham carried the dangerous implements, the wood, um, the fire and the knife, while Isaac carried the wood. Isaac said, my father, here is the wood and the fire, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham's answer was intended to spare his son any pain, but in it is an ob oblique expression of faith. He said, my son, the Lord shall provide for himself a lamb. Jehovah Jireh. Picture the scene. Abraham builds the altar, ties his son to the altar, and takes the knife to plunge it into the heart of his beloved, his only son, the child of promise. And it is only then that the angel of the Lord intervenes. Genesis 2 verse 22 verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. The angel of the Lord is an Old Testament term of the pre-incarnate Christ. He appeared to Abraham, Joshua, at Jericho, and Mrs. Manoah. But why send Abraham on three days' journey to Moriah? Couldn't any other place nearer do? Why take those three days journey to that mountain? In 2 Chronicles 3 verse 1, we are told that Solomon built the temple of Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. The very place where the true Lamb of God would ultimately be sacrificed for the sins of the world was the place where God sent Abraham. Somehow, Abraham's own journey would prefigure God's own giving of Jesus as Savior of the world. Abraham's own agonizing would prefigure Christ's own emotional journey as he agonized with his father in Gethsemane and yielded to the will of his
Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Abraham's journey is a lesson and an example to all true believers, no matter how challenging the call of God. Like Abraham, as soon as we are convinced that this is the command of God, we too should obey and against all hope still believe that the promises of God will be fulfilled. Abraham is thus the highest and most perfect example of faith. And by his offering of his son, the church received the assurance that the Son of God incarnate in the flesh would upon that very mountain offer the sacrifice divinely necessary for the pardon of man's sin. Hebrews 11 verse 17 and 18 tells us, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham's body was sexually past it. Sarah's womb was dead, and yet God resurrected their reproductive systems to produce the child. And the text is saying the same faith he had in believing that God could perform that miracle is the same faith that made him obey, believing that God, if he offered his sons, would raise him back from the dead. The blessing now given to Abraham differs from those that preceded him. In it, three particulars are given. First, it is no longer a promise, but a solemn compact by an oath. Next, it assures Abraham's seed of victory, whereby the spiritual Israel is certified of the triumph, of the ultimate triumph of the gospel. Lastly, it transfers to Abraham's offspring, the promise of being the means of blessedness to all mankind. Abraham's character of superlative obedience is held out as an ideal to which all true children of God must aspire. If we truly belong to Christ, then obedience is the proof that we love him, that we are truly committed to him. Abraham illustrates that love is the only true motive that guides the way of the true believer. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 37, 38. Now I say, now I know that you really love me. Now I know that you really love me in that you have not withheld from me your most cherished possession. Abraham's obedience was a proof of the genuineness of his commitment. We sing the song, I love thee, I love thee, I love thee, my God. I love thee, my Savior. I love thee, my God. I love thee, I love thee. But now thou dost know how much I love thee, my actions will show. Yes, now I know that you love me. It is only as we obey in the small things of life that we will ultimately obey in the great and challenging things. For he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. As Christians, we often give in too easily, much too easily, when tests and trials come. Why not learn from God's true heroes and those, and through the eyes of faith, see in each situation a great learning opportunity to go to another level with God? Indeed, Hebrews 12 verse 4 says, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving 
against him. We often give in much too easily when tests and trials come. In the mountain. In the mountain, it will be provided. Jehovah Jireh. Moriah was a holy place. God sent Abraham to that place. God commanded that he make a supremely challenging sacrifice. To obey did not seem to make sense. But in love and trust, he obeyed his God. In the mountain of test, God provided a way out for Abraham. In the mountain of darkness and distress, God provided. In the, mount, in the moment when only the eyes of faith could see any possibility of a way through, God provided. Are you feeling the hardness of the way? As you seek to follow the call of your God. Do you struggle as you seek to make sense of the conflicting challenges you face day by day? God shall provide a way out. In the mountain of your defeat, God shall provide a way. In the mountain of your loss, he shall show you a way through. In the mountain of your loneliness, feel his loving embrace. In the mountain of your hopelessness, see the light at the end of the tunnel. In the mountain of darkness, see the light of dawn on the horizon. In the mountain of desperation, Jehovah Jireh, God shall provide and make a way. Of victory. God can bring a song of joy where before there was only weeping, pain, sorrow, and despair. No matter what may be your situation, God can turn your night into day, your grief into joy, your mourning into song. Look at the experience of the great biblical heroes. What in human eyes often seems to be a path that has one end, ruin. Failure, poverty, despair turns out to be God's path of growth and victory and honor and glory. Whatever the trial. If God sends it, take it. If God sends it, carry it. If it is God's burden for you, carry it. And at the end of it all, like Abraham and Isaac, when you look back at Moriah, it will forever be for you the summit of your greatest achievement, the moment of your greatest triumph. Remember always, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, said Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. And God is faithful. He will not allow you. And he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. In closing, one day soon, one day soon, this whole earth will become one great Moriah. One day soon, this whole earth will become one great Gethsemane, one great Calvary, where each person will have to make a decision as to whom they will serve. According to Revelation 13, the time will come when the citizens of earth will be called upon to prove their loyalty to the lamb or to the beast. Then your bank account will be on the line. Then your pension pot will be on the line. Then your fancy sports car will be on the line. Then your million pound house will be on the line because you will not be able to buy or sell. Will you, like Abraham, be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for him? The challenge as Abraham faced will be Christ or Satan, material possessions or heaven, 
the truth of God's word or the deceptions of the enemy. It was only as Abraham was willing to be faithful to God in the small tests of life that he was able to pass the big test when they came. Jeremiah 12 verse 5 says, If you have run with footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace it was in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the flood plain of the Jordan? If you are struggling today to be loyal to God when things are easy, then when things really, really get rough, how will you stand? How will you survive? So, no matter what may be your situation, God can turn your night into day, your grief into joy, your mourning into song. Whatever the trial, if God sends it, take it. If God sends it, carry it. If it, it was God's burden, if it is God's burden for you, carry it. And at the end, like Abraham and Isaac, when you look back at the journey of your life, that moment of test will be forever the summit of your greatest achievements. May God bless you as you go forward facing God's plan for your life. Yes, Jehovah Jireh, in the moment of darkness and testing, God will provide for himself a way through. Amen. Thank you for that wonderful message. As we come to the end of our service now, let us close with our final hymn.